A blessed morning church family and a warm welcome to the Calvary Center English service this Sunday morning. It's a joy and it's a privilege to have you joining us today for the service, to worship together, to hear the word of God together and to fellowship with one another. I'm sure that there is something amazing in store for you today. So let's prepare ourselves in prayer. Let's open our hearts to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer today. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for each and every one who is joining today. We thank you, Lord. It's another Sunday morning, a day of rest, a day of, Lord, fellowshipping with your people, a day of connecting, Lord, to the wine, Lord, to hear the word, to receive that word, Lord, that builds our faith. And we thank you that today something new is going to happen in the lives of those who are joining. We pray and come in this service we pray that during the worship and praise, that spirits will be uplifted. There will be great, Lord, strength that will be released through your spirit to your people today. We commit this service into your hands in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Let's get ready to praise God today. We can clap our hands. Say celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, celebrate, Jesus celebrate, His reason, His reason. He is risen and he lives forevermore. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. The resurrection. The resurrection of our Lord. Woo! Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus celebrate his reason. He is risen. He is risen. And he lives forevermore. Forevermore. His reason. He is risen. He is risen. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate the resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Woo! Some joy in the house. Celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus, celebrate. Celebrate, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. We celebrate you, Lord Jesus. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. We say his reason. He is risen. He is risen. And he lives forevermore, forevermore. He is risen. He is risen. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on. Come on and celebrate. The resurrection. The resurrection of our Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The most. Blessed be the name of the Lord. One more time. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The most high. Say, say, blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The most high. The name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into ring, and they are saved. The name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into ring, and they are saved. Glory to the name. Glory to the name of the Lord. To the name of the Lord, glory to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Glory to the name of the Lord, glory to the name of the Lord, glory to the name of the Lord, the Most High. The name of the Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. There's just one in to ring, and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in to ring, and they are saved. And we say, celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Celebrate. Jesus celebrate Someone celebrate the Lord this morning Celebrate Jesus celebrate Celebrate Jesus celebrate Because He's risen He is risen He is risen And He lives forevermore He's risen He is risen. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. Come on and celebrate. The resurrection. The resurrection of our Lord. Woo! Let's cup our hands to the Lord. And we say, My Savior, Redeemer, you've lifted me from the mighty clay. You are the Almighty God. We'll always worship you, Lord, with sound and shouts of praises unto you, O oh God. We say, my Savior, my Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the mighty clay. Almighty, Almighty, Woo! forever, I'll never be the same, cause you can me from the everlasting, everlasting to the world we live. The Father's only Son Because you live You live And you die And you rose again on high You open The way For the world to live again Hallelujah For all you die My Savior My Savior Redeemer Lifted me from the mighty Almighty, Almighty, forever. I will never be the same. Cause who came me from the everlasting to the world we live? The Father's only Son. Because you live, you live, and you die, and you rose again on high. Lord, you open the way for the world to live again. Hallelujah for all. Hallelujah for all you've done. Hallelujah for all you've done. Hallelujah, Hallelujah for all you've done. Let's shout a celebration.
praise and shout to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. You are worthy. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Someone say you are Alpha. You are Alpha. And Omega. We worship. We worship you. Provider, my provider, we worship you, Lord. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be. You are our Father, Lord, my healer. You are our Father, Lord, my healer. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Oh, we give you glory. Oh, the glory. We worship. We worship. We worship. Oh, yes, Lord, you are. 
want the Lord to do for us. Some people are trusting God for a healing at this point. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Let's sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every darkness. Every direction starts to break. Declaring there is hope. Hope in the Lord. And there's faith. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Every stronghold. Shine through the shadows by light of light. Oh, yes, we want to speak. Let's say, I just want to speak the name of Jesus mm, over every fear and all anxiety. Yes, oh, to every soul. Because your name is power, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Yes, Lord, break every stronghold, every stronghold, shine through these shadows, my light the fire. And we say, shout Jesus in the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, and Jesus for my family, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, say Jesus. Somebody say, shout Jesus from the mountain. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the stream. Jesus in the darkness. Oh my every. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my family. I speak the name of Jesus. Hey, Jesus. We say, shout Jesus from the mountain. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in My family, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. One more time, shout Jesus from the mountain. Shout Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the street. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a good God. Amen. And here we are uh, at, the, at the most important time of the service where we hear the word of God. Last week, you have watched and you followed the sermon series that is done by Pastor Lohan on the book of 1 Thessalonians. Last week, we did chapter 1. And today is going to be a sermon on chapter 2 of the book of 1 Thessalonians. So I encourage you to take out your notebooks, your Bibles, be ready to dive into the Word of God with us 
and hear what God has in store for you. Be blessed as Pastor Lohan brings the word of God to you. Thanks. Good morning, church. Nice to be with you again on a beautiful Sunday morning. And uh, nice to see all your smiling faces. And I'm actually going to talk about one particular minister today as we turn into 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, before I go to chapter 2, let me quick, quickly give you a bit of a fast track of chapter 1. If you remember from last week, we, uh, my theme was a shining example because that's what the Thessalonian church was. I'm not going to go through all of it because I already preached it and Shakespeare does not repeat himself and so neither does Lohan. But uh, some of the key points was that uh, Paul was really concerned at what had happened to the Thessalonian church. He never had a chance to really impart to them, to build all those fundamentals, the faith. And then he had to leave in a hurry because of the persecution. He sends Timothy back to see how they're doing. And Timothy brings this amazing report. And Paul is like megaly proud of, his, of the church in Thessalonica. So much so that he says that you are not just an example to all of Macedonia and Achaia, but to every believer. And the three things that Paul talks about is that, number one is that the Thessalonian church had a faith that was visible. They were not just talkers. They were doers. They lived what they preached. They walked the talk. They had a faith that was visible. Secondly, they had a love. They had a love that was all conquering. It was, it, you know, it was an enduring. Um, they toiled in their love. They did not give up on love. Love for God, love for each other. They toiled in their love. They were laboring in love. That's something that we saw that was amazing in the Thessalonica church. And then thirdly, they had a hope that was always persevering. They never gave up. Hope never gave up. And because of that, Paul says, because of this, you are a shining example to all believers all over the world. 2,000 plus years later, Lohan is preaching in a small country, in an even smaller city, and to a church, and we are still talking about the example of the Thessalonians. It rings out over eternity. And that's where we ended chapter 1. Now, as we come to chapter 2, um, you know that Paul had to leave Thessalonica in a hurry uh, because the persecution was intense and it was, it was coming in waves. And, uh, you know, just like, you know, uh, and, and he ran out and Jason got caught. They came, surrounded his house. They, gave him a, they roughed him up. Um, he lost a couple of teeth. He was thrown into jail for a couple of days. But you know what? Jason's testimony stood strong. Um, but, you know, uh, Paul was... One of the things that Paul could not do because he had to leave was he was not able to defend his accusers. And because Paul was not there, because Timothy was not there, because Silas was not there, all Paul's accusers had a field day. They just thrashed him. I mean, they, whatever thought came into their minds, they just thrashed him. Oh, he's a moneymaker. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He does all these things for personal gain. You can't trust this fellow. The Jews who rejected Paul, I mean, they just took him to the dogs. They hammered him with many, many allegations. And Paul was not there to defend himself. He was exposed. They had a field day with him. So Paul writes to the Thessalonian church in chapter 2 and he opens up his heart to them. He wants to talk about where he where he's coming from. If you have ever been, if you have been, if you have ever been taken to the dogs by other people's accusations, by other people's gossip, by other people's false rumors and stories, you would know how devastating it can be. How devastating it can be. I remember a time when, you know, in Gaul, I was accused of running brothels to feed and to fund the ministry. That my lady workers were prostitutes. That's what I was, that's what the story was. And that I was a child abuser. That I would take these children through all these kids clubs and, you know, how many children were abused? Not one was, but that's the story that went around. And I remember one day coming home and I said, Lord, if you would give me 15 seconds, just 15 seconds, to leave my testimony aside, all I need is 15 seconds. I'll take that fellow, dash him on the ground, rough him up, and he'll be gone. Because I, that's how I felt. 
It was unfair. And then Jesus whispers into my ear and says, so for 15 seconds you are willing to give up your testimony, yeah? That's why the Bible says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you because loving your persecutors don't come easy. It took me one month to pray after that because I did not want to pray for my persecutors. It's hard. Paul is a man who persecuted the church, threw believers into jail. He had an encounter with God, a face-to-face -face encounter. He turned his life upside down. If there was a man who was genuine about anything, it was Paul, and here he's been thrown to the dogs. Paul felt that he needed to open his heart, at least to the people who would understand him. And even as Paul opens his heart, we get a chance to pry into his heart to see the heart of a faithful minister. I pray that as we look into his heart, we will draw from this man's life and fuel our service of God. Service. Service is never at convenience. Service is always comes with commitment. We have got so used to as a modern day society you have been going to Cargill's for 15 years, but because Kiel's came next door, now you go to Kiel's. There is no loyalty. My dad banked with one bank for most of his life. I have banked with so many banks. Every time I don't like that bank, I start another bank account. There is no loyalty. There is, there is no loyalty. There is nothing called commitment. Even in ministry and leadership and all, everything is convenience. Oh, it must be convenient to me. Don't get the C's mixed up. In ministry, it's about commitment. It's never about convenience. It's always about faithfulness. The currency of heaven is never in US dollars. The currency of heaven is faithfulness. So let me give you five lessons of a faithful minister through the life of Paul. As we open chapter 2, we looked at verse 2 and 3 we see that one of the first life lessons we can learn about ministry is that a faithful minister has a hunger for souls. Now, when I talk about minister, I'm not talking about pastors. I'm not talking about full-time. As you know, all believers are ministers in the kingdom of God. If you think that your ministry is about warming seats, you're in the wrong kingdom. In the kingdom of God, every single one of us is a minister. So all of this applies to us. A faithful minister has a hunger for souls. This is one of the first qualities we see in Paul's life as he opens chapter 2. Despite all the opposition, all the allegations and challenges and persecution, here was a man who longed for souls. In verse 2 and 3, it says, You know how badly we were treated in Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. In those words, embedded in those verses, is where you see a man who is driven by a hunger for souls. If you ever want to serve God, you need to have a hunger for souls. We are so preoccupied with our own lives that we have no time to hurt for someone else. We have no time to hurt for someone else because we are so preoccupied with what's going on in our lives. Paul was gripped by the thought of people around him going to hell. William Booth, the, foundation of the, the founder of the Salvation Army, I think echoes Paul's thoughts when he said, while there remains one dark soul, without the light of God, I will fight for him. I will fight to the very end. If there remains one Dark soul without the light of God. I will fight for him. I will fight to the very end. We talk, we sing, we preach so much of the second coming of the Lord. Well, the sad news is that 50% of the world has not even heard about the first coming. How in the world do we stand and be proud of ourselves? 
buy buildings and seats. We fill this time 10 times, oh, it won't be enough. Reality is that there'll be more in hell than in heaven. At the end of the day, the biggest obstacle to evangelism are Christians who don't care about people enough to share the gospel. Albert Moller says, the Apostle Paul, the first thing that he speaks to us about our ministry is that we must always have a passion for souls. A hunger for people who are not enjoying life like you and I enjoy in God. The second lesson that we see from Paul, the servant, the faithful servant's life is that Paul was concerned about pleasing God rather than pleasing men. Verse 4 of chapter 2, For we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is never to please man. Our purpose is to please God, not people. Paul had a very strong value of his calling. He took his calling very seriously. To the Corinthian church, he says, I'm an ambassador of Jesus. Here he says that he is standing in the place of God. I've been entrusted with the good news. His calling came from up there. He was not concerned about what people thought about him. Oh, but if I say this, they might get upset. I might lose my friends. Oh, if I do this or if I go there, oh, people, what will they think about me? He was not concerned about those things. Paul's one ambition in life was to put a smile on God's face. To make God get up from his seat and go, wow, that's my boy. We really need to become God pleasers. Sometimes we go home, so oh, that was a nice service. I felt really good about it. Sometimes we just need to pause and say, Lord, what do you think? Are you pleased with how I serve you? I can't ever balance the scales of blood versus my life. Never repay you for what you did for me. But with what I do, are you happy? Do I put a smile on your face? Paul's the only aim. Amidst all the slander, gossip, accusations, allegations, he was only concerned that God would be happy with him and God would smile. This is not a performance-based ministry. This is a simple man in love with God wanting to please the one who saved him. Thirdly, a faithful servant has a heart full of pure motives. In verse 3, Paul says, you can see we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. Never once did we try to win you with flattery. As you well know, and God is our witness that we were not pretend to be your friends just to get your money. So much has been said about these days, uh, so much has been said about us these days. We have all been painted with the same brush. People like us, they err uh, or they, they make big decisions and then we all get painted with the same brush. There was a time in our, in our, in our, in our history where you were proud to say that you were a born again Christian. It's a big thing. Today, it carries a stigma. You are proud to say that you are this, but now you hide sometimes. You cower. Evil exists when good people do nothing. If there is ever a time for authentic Christianity to raise its head, it is now. If there is ever a time for an authentic church model to stand up and tell the nation and the world, this is what church is, it is now. We 
We have a massive challenge to put the record straight. We will always have people who will say things about us. Oh goodness me, I have been at the fleck of that for many, many years. You drive a car, he's robbing church money. You go abroad, he took church money. You do this, ah, you wait and see. Once I remember that I was, that there was one time where I was banned from speaking at any samithya, you know these different, different things, samithyas in, uh, in the Gaul City Council because this fellow had honey dripping from his mouth, it seems. Right? He had a way with words that he can woo you with trickery and well, I might have a way with words but I don't think there's honey coming out of this mouth. <laughs> right? And I was banned. I mean, they would actually go from place to place saying, never. Because there was a time when I was invited to speak, you know, at different, different non-Christian events. And it was a really big thing in those kind of environments. You know, I sat on the Inter-Religious Council, on the Governor's Advisory Board. And, and then there was this massive campaign that you just don't make, you don't give this man any opportunity to go to any school, any summit or anything like that because he woos you with magic. I wish I could wave a wand on Adele. Nothing's working. <laughs> Those things you just, like a fly, you know. Never let it get into your heart and soil your spirit. But there are things that you and I have to stand up for. For what's right. For the authenticity of the gospel. Yesterday I was listening to... Uh, Kaya's life circle going on and the question, what is the difference in those days how they shared the gospel and these days how we share the gospel? And I, and she and her leader were grappling with this and so Kaya asked me, Tati, what's the difference? If there is ever a time for us to return to the authentic gospel in the Bible, if there is ever a time for authentic pastors and leaders to stand up, authentic Christians and authentic churches to stand up, it's now, my friends. Because until we stand up and do something, the devil is having a field day with souls and taking thousands to hell. Let our service be full of pure motives. When you engage a community, you love them. When they embrace your gospel, you love them. When they reject your gospel, you continue to love them. That's where pure motives are. There is no trickery. You don't have to add to the gospel. You don't have to be some sort of way the gospel has its own power. It never loses its power. It works in its own way because the Holy Spirit works and prepares souls. You need to go and stand and just give it. Stand alone in the presence of the Lord when you serve God and say, Lord, test my heart. Test my motives. Life lesson number four from the Apostle Paul, a faithful servant has deep love for his spiritual children. Look at those verses that Paul talks to the Thessalonian church. He says, we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. You know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. I know we don't have not all of us have great fathers and mothers kind of parenting models, but I don't know, Paul is talking about a parental model here that is just inspiring. It was one of Paul's most beautiful qualities. He literally saw his disciples as his children, as his own kids. I mean, I, I can, I, I think I love people.
But to say like a mother, like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. I have seen when the girls were growing, when the girls were babies, how caring a mother can be. When you're just tired and you go to bed, the mother stays up trying to feed and care for the children. This is Paul's most amazing quality. We often thought, think about Paul as someone who is very choleric and very da -da 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 -da. do this, do that, others, you wild evil doers, mutilators of the flesh. So like Batman on steroids. I labor in birth pains for you until you are formed like Christ. He tells the Galatian church. Night and day I toil for you in love and prayers. He tells the Philippian church. And to the Thessalonian church he says, like a mother, a nursing mother feeding her young, like a father treats his own children, if there was one engine that drove, drove, drove Paul's ministry, it was love. When you serve God, never forget why you serve. You must always serve in love. The engine of ministry, whether it be out there or in here, is love. Now we often think love means all grace, no rules or principles, that is wrong. Because love, Jesus came with truth and grace. But when you don't have love, what happens? What you get is lack. As a spiritual parent, Paul took these believers, his believers under his wings, molded them and formed them to make them like mini Pauls. This is some serious stuff here. You open Paul's heart, you're looking for life lessons. Yes, there are so many. But right down there, there is a nucleus with the word love written on it. When you go dry on love, take a break from ministry. For God so loved the world. And finally, a faithful servant has a powerful life example. You yourselves are our witnesses. This is Paul's habit. I mean, it's not like this is like a one-off occasion. You yourselves are our witnesses and God is. That we were devout and honest and faultless towards all of you believers. I don't know whether I can say that. But Paul could. Faultless. To the Ephesian church in Acts 20, 20, he tells the elders, tell me if I have done anything wrong amongst you. Anything that I have to pay back. Anything. You tell me. Tell me now. And the elders go, there is nothing. That was the example of Paul. And I will tell you why Paul's presentation of the gospel was so strong. You know why? Because his life was the evidence of the gospel. The full presentation of the gospel was made complete by Paul's life. You look at what he says, you look at what he preaches, you see the power of God, you see the love of God, and then, okay, does all of this change a man? You look at Paul, and the greatest miracle in the universe is a changed life. And Paul was that example. How powerful is the gospel? How effective is the gospel? Can it do what it says it can? Can it truly change a life? After all the evangelism, preaching and teaching, the final evidence comes down to a life. And Paul's example was the only one they ever needed. This was a man who persecuted Christians. Look at him now. A man who was, who was consumed by rage 
Now he's consumed by love. Reputation is what people think you are. Character is what God knows you as you are to be. In Paul's case, he was able to merge both into one example. That's what made his gospel so powerful. Because the first Bible most people will read is your life. Not the new international version. They had to go all the way to this Bible house or back to the Bible to find a Bible. The first Bible, your friends, your neighbors, the people in your office, the first Bible they read is your life. That's why the biggest hindrance to the good news is not persecution. The biggest hindrance to the good news is when it is carried by bad Christians. The good news is powerful when it is taken by good people. And Paul shows us what does that mean. I remember many years ago I planted a center of hope in the Vanni and because of the nature, because of the the plant involved government, army, and all that. And you know, a lot of people were, they are, the spotlight was on us. One step and you'll be out of there and all that. And so I did what uh, normal pastors won't do. I put a ban on my team from sharing the gospel for six months. Right? Something that more no pastor will ever do. Some, definitely no missions pastor will ever do. I put a ban on them from sharing the gospel for six months. And one night, my team leader calls me and says, uh, Pastor Lo, we have a problem here. There is a mother with four children who wants to convert. And I, I'll tell you, I, I just got so panicky because I knew what was going on. I, I said, what is wrong with you? I told you all not to share the gospel. Who shared the gospel? Go and check with everyone. There were six people on the team. Go and check with everyone. Ask them, whoever shared the gospel is coming straight back home. I mean, for the things that you get disciplined in church, the last thing you would think is that you're getting disciplined for sharing your faith, no? And say, no, but you know, I, I checked with the team. None of us. I said, don't be. One of you all are a liar. No, you all going to be in even greater trouble. Go and see who is lying to me. I promise you. So one by one, come on the phone. No, we did not. We did not talk to anyone about Jesus. Then I said, bring the mother into the veranda with the children. Ask her questions. I will ask you translate for her. And this mother, she goes on. She says, when you all came, we knew you were Christians. You all were outsiders from Colombo. You all don't know what we went through during the war. And we studied you. Because we knew that you were coming to convert us. We knew you were coming with all these big social programs that you all did. You all taught in our schools. You all played with our children. You did your feeding programs. But we knew behind that there was an ulterior motive. At least that's what we were told. But our villagers have studied you for months. We have watched you when you are on your off days. When you play together, when you talk together, when you eat together. Singhalese and Tamil in one team. People who speak very fluent English, who have left big jobs, and people who come from much more challenging backgrounds. You all, the way you all work with each other, the way you all love each other, it has changed how we think about you. I am here, but the whole village is talking about you all. I don't know who your God is. I don't know what your religion is. But what you have, I want my four children to have. My friends, I couldn't have been more prouder. A team, no more older than 26 or 27 years old. Your life is the first Bible the people around you will read. I have not come here, but I hope that one day I can say before God and man, you know how faultless I am. Point a finger at me and show a weakness in my ministry. 
in my example. I wish. But that's what we must attain. Have a hunger for souls. Seek to please God and not man. Keep your heart always pure. Have a deep parental love for children you raise in the faith. Let love be your nucleus. And let your life speak louder than your sermons. The Apostle Paul speaks to us today. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Oh, worship your name. Hallelujah. Let the Spirit of the Lord just minister to you right now. Let His Word sink deep in. Don't let it find just the first level of soil. Open your hearts and give the Spirit access to go deeper. All that I am, all that I have, I lay them down before you, O oh Lord. All of my plans, all of my plans my heart and my hands are lifted to you Lord I offer my life to you everything I've been through use it for your glory Lord I offer my Lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. All I offer Would you stand with me this morning and raise your hands to the Lord and surrender yourself to Him and sing all that I am. All that I am, all that I have. I lay them down before you, O oh Lord. All my regrets and all my acclaims, the joy and the pain, I'm making them yours. Lord, I offer my life to you, everything I Pleasing sacrifice, Lord, I offer you my love. Have a hunger for souls, seek to please God and not man. Always keep your heart pure. Let the nucleus of all ministry be your love, and let your life speak louder than your words. Would you ask the Lord to do this in your heart so that you can be a faithful servant like the Apostle Paul was? Put your right hand on your heart and raise your left hand to the heavens as I ask Adele to lead us in prayer. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you have spoken, Lord, through your word. Lord, I pray for each of our hearts. Lord, that we will be open to what your word is telling us this morning. Lord, where we have faltered, we pray and ask for, for your forgiveness. And we ask, Lord, that you will compel us by your love to love others the way you loved us. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will help us, Lord, to have a burden for souls. Lord, to be committed, Lord, Lord, to service. Lord, I pray, Father, that, 
Lord, that we will see ourselves as ministers, not just people with tags, but people who, Lord, like Paul, offer their lives in service of you. Lord, to this end, we commit our lives, we commit our hearts to your will. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Amen. What an amazing word. What an amazing direction we have received this morning from the word of God. From the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm sure the five points that pastor spoke have found a place in your heart this morning. It may it not just remain, but let it do something new in your life in this week that is coming up. And remember, next week is the third sermon on this series that we are on. So don't miss out on joining next Sunday as well. And as we bring this time to a close, I'd encourage you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Let's commit ourselves, our families and everything that we have for the week ahead. I'm sure that God has spoken this word to you, not by accident, but because he is ready to act upon what he has spoken to you today. Father, we thank you for everyone who has heard the word of God. We thank you. Lord, that we have an opportunity to connect like this, although we may not be in the same place. Father, I pray the words that have been spoken today will find a dwelling place in the hearts of your people and not just remain, but it will begin to transform and it will begin to bear fruit in the lives of your people. We pray, Father, that every workplace, every home, every Lord street, Father, every neighborhood, Lord, every vehicle that, is, that uh, your people are traveling in will be blessed and the people that they encounter will be blessed, will be impacted through what you are doing in the lives of your people. Father, so we thank you once again for all that you have done. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and we commit ourselves to your hands for this week ahead. Lord, go before us and prepare the way. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said... Amen. As we have brought this service to a close, go and have an amazing day, an amazing week ahead, and we will see you next Sunday at the same place online. God bless you.